my main mentors and teachers and um you know where I learned a lot from him during my fellowship we have Dr. Eric Sturgis um he's a professor uh with tenure in the department of otolaryngology head and neck surgery at Baylor um and he's also the vice chair of clinical affairs and an endowed chair and um he's also the head and neck thyroid multidisciplinary program director and so, you know, I met him uh, at MD Anderson, where he was there for 23 years, actually completed fellowship and was on faculty for 23 years. And obviously, um, again, one of my main mentors that I really looked up to and still look up to today. And so um, we're really glad that he joined us, even if it's virtually. Um, he's going to be speaking to us about HPV related or fragile cancer problem what to do for millions not vaccinated and or born in the 20th century. So thank you so much, Dr. Sturgis. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk today about, uh, you know, some of the epidemiology and basics of oropharyngeal cancer vaccination and um, then I'm going to talk about some of our work around uh, trying to develop a screening paradigm for um, for oropharynx cancer. Um, I don't have any conflicts of uh, interest to list. Uh, I previously had a, an award from Roche um, providing free reagents for some of our work. That's now in someone else's hands for the past uh, four years. Um, that's all my disclosures. Again, we're going to talk about the problem of oropharynx cancer, uh, the issues of vaccination, whether vaccination is going to really answer this problem, and then we'll talk about um, work uh, we're doing around early detection. We'll take a step back and talk about the tobacco problem in this country. This is from um, the 20th century and tobacco, pounds of tobacco per adult in the U.S. and just a little historical context. It was 1929, the first really serious paper on lung cancer associated with smoking. It was 1939, Dr. DeBakey, who's um, got uh, contact, uh, of course, or uh, strong history here at Baylor, but also my, where I did my residency in New Orleans, Dr. DeBakey uh, did some of his uh, initial training there uh, at Tulane um, with Dr. Ochsner in their paper on lung cancer was in 1939, um, attributing it to smoking. And then the first really serious epidemiologic studies in the 50s, um, first with lung cancer, and then later with head and neck cancer, showing in large studies that head and neck cancer is associated uh, strongly with cigarette consumption. And then in 1964, of course, the Surgeon General's warning. And you can see since the 60s, we've seen decline in cigarette use. When I, um, was in residency in the early 90s. Uh, we had about 25% of U.S. adults were current smokers. It's now, I think the re most recent, it's only uh, 10 to 12% of, of U.S. adults currently smoking. This is uh, Dr. Luther Terry, he was the Surgeon General that put together the committee that ultimately came up with the uh, report uh, on smoking and health. Um, interesting story from a small town in uh, in Alabama rose to really be a major uh, contributor to public health in our country. And I had the honor of, uh, well, just last uh, couple years, this was uh, um, uh, estimated the number of cancer deaths averted by the reduction in cigarette use in the U.S. shown graphically here, basically 2.6 million cancer deaths averted thanks to reduction in tobacco use in the U.S., 8 million total premature deaths averted, um, thanks to really the work of uh, Dr. Terry and, of course, uh, others. And I had the honor of taking care of uh, Dr. Terry's son. Um, this is Mr. Michael Terry, who did not have smoking-related cancer. He had an HPV-related oropharynx cancer. You can see some of the radiation effects there in his neck. He's pictured here with Dr. Mickey LeMater. Dr. LeMater was the last surviving member of the commission that, uh, the committee that Dr. Terry put together uh, to advise the country on a cigarette consumption. He was the former 
chancellor of the UT system, University of Texas system, as well as the former president of MD Anderson. And we lost both of these men in the last uh, five years, Mickey Lemater in 2017 and Michael Cherry, really due to the long-term effects of, of head and neck cancer treatment in uh, 2021. So this is what the SEER data looks like for um, for men uh, and women uh, for oropharyngeal cancer. You can see for men, the dramatic increase we all are well aware of since the mid nineties. For women actually now starting to see a, a, a slow rise uh, annual, this means annual percent change um, since um, around 2000, um, uh, there is a slight uptick in the number of oropharynx cancers in women as well. For African-American men, there may be the early signs, you know, they've benefited from, from the reduction in tobacco consumption with oropharynx cancer rates dropping, but now starting to see perhaps a slight uptick. Um, time will tell whether this is a real or just uh, 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 an, uh, an aberration, but probably starting to see a real uptick uh, among African-American men as well. And of course, tobacco consumption re resulted in reduced incidence of larynx cancer and, and other head and neck cancers. Um, but the way the SEER registry codes tongue, where it's a generic site tongue and mixes oral tongue and basal tongue, um, likely this increase, which mimics the oropharynx um, listed group, is really probably driven by oropharynx cancers that are misclassified in the SEER registry. Just to point that out, if you're ever um, looking at those um, in the SEER registry. Um, oropharynx cancer has now become the most common uh, HPV related cancer in the United States. Uh, this is um, the five years around 2014. You can see oropharynx cancer now represents 40% of, of HPV related cancers in the US. About a third are cervix cancer and 18% uh, are anal cancers. Uh, and as far as uh, men and women, 80% in men are oropharynx cancer. And in women, it's about 50% or cervical cancer. Uh, and the rising proportion in women is really uh, anal cancer, which uh, represents one out of five HPV related cancers in women. Um, most <clears throat> the numbers for this year are now about 60,000. Um, so almost doubling over the last um, uh, almost 10 years. Um, and again, oropharynx cancer uh, remains the uh, number one. There's been some work done um, showing that oropharynx cancer may become one of the top five cancers among uh, non, at least non-Hispanic uh, white men uh, in the next uh, 20 uh, years. There's been work among women showing clearly um, anal cancers rise. This is the annual percent change rather dramatic among women age 65 to 74, where anal cancer is now the number one uh, HPV related cancer among women. Vulvar cancer has always been uh, a major issue among elderly women, but cervical cancer may be overtaken among um, middle aged women in the not too distant future. This is anal cancer rising at over 5% uh, uh, each year. Oropharynx cancer showing up here in purple, and you can see among all three age groups, significant rise, though rather slow. Uh, among all three age groups among women. How about survival? Well, I'm sure at the Cleveland Clinic, you, your survival rates are probably similar to what we had at MD Anderson, you know, uh, just generically overall around 80% five-year survival rates. If we look at it nationally, of course, the survival rates won't be as good. Um, and then we see here in, in the darker uh, orange or red color, uh, African Americans who have a much lower proportion being HPV related. But you can see at a population level among women and among men, five year survival rates, they sort of hover around 70%. Not bad when we compare to, say, lung cancer. But of course, we as head and neck surgeons and, and um, head and neck clinicians, we recognize the long term effects of head and neck uh, treatment. 
you know, the, the, the big one here is the, the severe dysphagia and aspiration that ultimately happens to many of our patients, but the other radiation effects that uh, unfortunately a lot of our patients suffer with. Work done uh, when we were at MD Anderson, really driven by Adam Garden and Christina Dahlstrom, 1,700 patients treated, all treated MD Anderson with radiation or chemo radiation. Um, all 1,700 were five years or more from the end of their uh, radiation treatment. In other words, people that you would assume were cured of their cancer. And their survival here shown in black compared to their expected actuarial survival. And you can see here at 15 years, 40% below expected survival. So these people are dying of non-cancer related deaths, really treatment related aspiration is probably the main driver here long-term. So there's a lot of treatment morbidity um, and non-cancer mortality. And, and it's an issue that I'm sure this, this audience is sympathetic to because we don't get the uh, recognition and say at NCI about our disease causing a lot of problems because our five-year survival rates are, you know, 70 to 80 percent. But really, um, the story is much deeper than, than five-year survival rates. So can we simply solve this problem by vaccinating the whole population? Um, well, of course, yes, uh, that will eventually um, eliminate HPV-related oropharynx cancer. The question is, will it do it in our, uh, our lifetimes? Just a review on vaccination. Um, it's, uh, the, it's, it, it essentially looks just like the virus, except it's only the L1 protein. These little stars are the L1 protein. The, the L2 protein is not present in the vaccine. Um, it's non-infectious, non-oncogenic, meaning there's no, of course, no DNA present within the, in the capsid here. And it is given with an adjuvant, which stimulates um, uh, immune response. It's also given intramuscular, which is a better antigen uh, presentation than natural infection. So you get more antibody production than a natural uh, oral or genital infection. Um, and the, the mantra to, to always speak about when we talk about vaccination to the lay public is it's clearly safe, effective, and long-lasting. So the current recommendation, girls and boys can start at age nine. You should finish your vaccination to two dose now in the United States by the 13th birthday. The two doses are six to 12 months apart. And once a kid reaches 15 years of age, then the, the current recommendation, this may change, but the current recommendation is three doses um, uh, that they should be receiving. Over the years, we've had some updates. The FDA approved the three dose regimen for men and women up to age 45. Uh, the CDC ACIP, which gives the advisory recommendation from the CDC, uh, recommended it for up to age 45 with shared decision making with the clinician. It's important that people who get vaccinated at older age realize that it's not um, uh, as uh, effective as had they received it before exposure as a child um, and that they should still maintain their regular uh, cancer screening. So cervical cancer screening among women should be maintained. Um, and then in 2020 was when they finally added oropharynx cancer officially to the FDA list of indications for the vaccine. So this was the catchy headline in 2018, Australia to eliminate cervical cancer within 10 years. It was based on this publication in Lancet Public Health, where because of really strong vaccination programs, which are school-based in Australia, as opposed to the US, um, as well as appropriate and comprehensive um, uh, implementation of cervical cancer uh, screening uh, efforts, they projected having cervical cancer rates below four in 100,000 by 2028 and cervical cancer mortality below one in 100,000 by 2034. And these were are commonly accepted indications that it's no longer a public health problem. I just pointed out as an amazing opportunity that the US is not able to achieve because our vaccinations 
rates remain rather poor. So nationally, you know, this is this is like, uh, let's see, about 15 years since the vaccine was initially approved for girls. Um, we still have not reached the 80 percent mark. So only as far as just having one dose, two doses, only 63. So less than two thirds of our kids are getting um, completing their vaccination by age 17. Um, in Texas, we're doing worse, but uh, this just shows the other, excuse me, the um, the three vaccines recommended for adolescents, the Tdap vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, and then here's HPV at the top. And you can see the different birth cohorts and how rapidly Tdap and meningococcus were adopted. Uh, uh, adopted by the population and quickly were over 80% uh, as opposed to HPV where we're still lagging below the 80% threshold. And just to take a step back and a stab at my own state and the problems that we have here, this is um, the problem of non-medical exemptions in Texas, uh, both public and private uh, schools. And this uh, past year, more than 85,000 kids in Texas, their parents did not vaccinate them. I'm not talking about HPV vaccine. I'm talking about vaccinations that are required. So for non-medical reasons, um, and we've become, now that California did change some of their legislation, we've become an epicenter for this anti-vaccine movement. We have, and this is a little bit older data here, but about almost a third of, of school districts in in the most populous regions of Texas, so North Te Dallas area, uh, Houston area, and the Austin San Antonio area, almost a third of school districts are below the threshold for measles vaccination. So I'm not sure what it is in Ohio, but I just encourage any of you that have the opportunity, please speak out on not only HPV vaccine, but uh, vaccination in general, how important it is to public health um, in our country. We have the Immunization Partnership to help here in Texas. I'm sure there's a, a similar nonprofit in, in, in uh, Ohio as well. So some of our friends at uh, Johns Hopkins, Carol Factory and Amber D'Souza published this past uh, year or, or two years ago now, a uh, fabulous paper in JAMA Oncology projecting vaccination rates going forward and how that would impact uh, how that would impact oropharyngeal cancer rates going forward. And so what they've done is projected the incidence rates of oropharynx cancer among the different age uh, populations uh, at presentation of cancer. And of course, you know, most of these cancers present in middle age and now shifting to an older uh, age population you see here in the gray, uh, which will dominate the future of oropharynx cancer. Um, and showing that in the dotted line, the impact of future vaccination and current vaccination on that instance rate. And you can see here for those uh, over age 55, really no effect until 2045. And the only group in which you really start to see a significant impact are this population that we rarely see, those under 45. And this would be, so in 2045, these would be people born in this century, not in the 20th century. So um, some of their conclusions were that the reduction or pharyngeal cancer incidence rate from current vaccination will remain negligible through 2045. And that in approximately 2060, we, we expect to realize a substantial reduction. So <clears throat> I don't know about Jamie, but I, I don't think I'll be around anymore in 2060. But um, you can see our careers are going to be remaining a problem for oropharynx cancer, and can we do something about it? This just shows the dramatic reduction in those age 30, you know, uh, born in the 20th century, vaccination will have by 2045. It'll basically cut the 2045 incidence in that, in that very young population in half. We also have the problem of our vaccination rates remain below goals, our pandemic delays in routine medical care. But I think the biggest problem is this problem of vaccine hesitancy and the problem of uh, distrust of public health recommendations that's been exacerbated by the uh, COVID pandemic. 
So let's talk now uh, in the closing uh, third of this about um, screening and could we um, could we identify a population that would be amenable to screening or could we simply just screen everyone? So uh, our disease incidence is essentially uh, an order of magnitude lower than lung cancer. So just screening everyone, uh, probably not feasible or financially. Um, and even in lung cancer, they you don't screen everyone, you screen specifically those with a certain amount of cigarette exposure. So we do know that this is more common in mid to older age white men. We know that uh, it's uh, uh, more common in the non-smoker, former smoker, but certainly smokers get it. Uh, middle to high socioeconomic status, and those with more than five sexual partners in their lifetime. The problem is all of these have quite significant exceptions. Certainly there are plenty of women that get this disease. There's certainly plenty of smokers that get this disease. And there's certainly low socioeconomic folks that get this. And frankly, a single partner is all someone needs to get exposure. So um, what about symptoms? Well, the other thing is these people don't usually have throat symptoms. 80% of the time this has been studied, numerous different uh, uh, ways uh, in which 80, about 80% 80 of people present with a metastatic neck mass as the reason they show up. So couldn't we, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Papa Nicolau, uh, inventor of the pap smear back in the 50s, and that, that, and that allowed us to reduce cervical cancer from the second most common cancer in the United States in World War II, among women, in World War II, to it's like the 13th most common cancer now among women, um, universal screening among women. Could we do that in, in oropharynx cancer? Um, well, I think this audience certainly knows the problem. The problem is these cryptic tonsils and inability to see these primaries as they begin. Um, so that's probably not our answer. Um, again, getting back to the demographic issue, you know, you can see the the, this is a really nice study done about uh, tw uh, almost five years ago now, showing if you if you look at different demographic exposure characteristics, um, you can really pick out a high risk group. Of course, even those with limited exposures have risk. Um, but one thing I wanted to point out is oral HPV. So is oral HPV our answer? Simply identifying like in cervix now, if you identify high risk HPV on um, uh, on your cervical pap, uh, that that has implications for how that woman's going to be screened and how frequently. Uh, could we do something similar with with um, with uh, oropharyngeal cancer? Well, here's the problem. The problem is among men, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent are going to have HPV present at any one point in time on an oral rinse. Women, it's around 5 percent. High risk HPV limited, of course, we'd want to limit it to high risk. It's still about 5 percent of the population are going to be positive. More recent paper just published, um, nice large, about uh, 3,200 individuals showing that among men, high-risk HPV types, um, around 7% of men will have uh, high-risk HPV on the oral rinse among, and that's middle-aged men, 51 to 60. Again, that sort of bimodal look to the prevalence. And among women, it's low, it's around one and a half percent. What's really important, of course, and we didn't talk about this, but HPV-16 is the driver of 85 to 90 percent of HPV-related oropharynx cancer, and about 2 percent of men in their 50s are going to be positive at any one point in time. So now we're getting down to a smaller population. Maybe this is an approach we could uh, we look at. Among women, it's about 1 percent of, of women in their 50s. Are there other biomarkers that might be uh, stronger? Well, this is the paradigm of how HPV causes cancer. It affects the, uh, uh, it gets integrated in most situations or it remains in a stable uh, HPV uh, um, uh, episome. Um, so the DNA is present. So one thing is we could use DNA as a marker uh, uh, of the person having a persistent H, 
HPV, or if it's in the blood, that indicates someone has an, in, uh, uh, an invasive process. Could we look at this, um, the issue of the E6 protein, E7 protein, and which are, of course, viral proteins, can we look at antibody response to these oncogenic proteins? That's another option that's been explored. Um, we and others have done work here. Our main collaborator, Karen Anderson at Arizona State, this was published in 2015, and we had uh, 250 uh, cancer-free individuals and 250 um, oropharynx cancers. You can see the dramatic difference in the serology to the E proteins of HPV-16 and not really to the L proteins. That difference, while significant, was not nearly as dramatic as, say, E6 or E7. We repeated the work in a larger study 300, almost 350 HPV-related cancers, 150 non-HPV, uh, uh, I mean, non-oropharynx cancers, and then over 700 cancer-free controls. Um, and, you know, here showing similarly uh, differences here. The, um, the sensitivity was 85%. The specificity was 99%. And the odds ratio, meaning the risk, the estimated risk if someone's seropositive, well over 400 uh, to be to have uh, oropharynx cancer. So if we think about in comparison, say lung cancer, if someone has the smoking history required for screening, your lifetime risk for a current smoker is on the order of 30 uh, percent. Um, and this, uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, the the risk is about 30, and this is a good uh, order of magnitude higher, though the disease is less common. Now, this has been done in uh, cohort studies where they had stored serum samples in patients later developing oropharynx cancer. The number of cancers in these studies, though they're very powerful studies, is not as, as large as our study, but the design is better. These are cohort studies. Uh, Amy Kramer, uh, the, the, the serology people are German group, Michael Paulita, uh, Tim Waterborough, very, very good work. This was JCO as early as 2013. Uh, they showed that you can have these sero antibodies sometimes more than 10 years prior to the cancer development. They also showed the risk for anal cancer was uh, very strong as well. And just uh, this was last year um, published um, by uh, that group and others, uh, combining data and estimating the risk if someone is serologically positive to HPV 16 E protein. So if you take a man who's age 50 um, and they're serologically positive, their chance to develop an oropharynx cancer in the next five years is one in 13 and one in six in the next 10 years by the age of 60. If you take a man age 60, they're serologically positive. Their chance to develop an oropharynx cancer in the next 10 years is more than one in four. So this is a highly, uh, very strong biomarker for later risk of oropharynx cancer. So we had the opportunity when I was at MD Anderson in 2017, we opened a study. It was a screening study called the Houston um, study um, to try to screen men without history of, of head and neck cancer to try to screen them for HPV related cancers, whether or pharynx, anal or penile. And we ultimately had 553 men enrolled. So of the men, uh, they were tested for serologic positivity to the E proteins, as well as for oral HPV-16. So we had 47 men who were either seropositive, by the way, there were six seropositive, um, and 47 that were either seropositive or oral HPV positive. Um, and then the rest were negative, 506 negative. And you could see, there was, a, there was a difference in um, the group that was what we would call at risk, having uh, less commonly being married uh, than those uh, that were negative. 
Um, in fact, you know, 27% were divorced um, and 17% were never married. They also had a history of 47, um, 48% to 22% more common to have had a sexual, sexually transmitted infection and to have had a partner with an abnormal cervical pap, 23 versus 12%. Uh, we did not see a dramatic difference in the, the proportion that reported being either gay or bisexual, 13% versus 10%. Um, we did see um, uh, more common that um, they reported oral general sex um, performing and receiving, and oral anal sex uh, was um, twice as prevalent. The number of female partners among men that reported being heterosexual or bisexual uh, was higher, and among the men reporting being gay or bisexual uh, was significantly higher. So again, we had 553 men enrolled. Um, we had six that were antibody positive. Two of these were also positive by oral rinse, and we had 41 that were antibody negative, but their oral rinse was positive. And these men that were considered at risk, these we called high risk, meaning antibody positive, and these were intermediate risk, being just oral rinse positive. They want, went on to in-person exams every six months. They also had anal and general exams. They also had ultrasound of the neck to try to identify early lymph node spread. So we had 52 men that were offered the stage two, meaning in-person examinations. Um, one of the six men declined um, of the high risk. Nine of the people who were just positive on their oral rinse declined. Um, and then we had five matched to the high risk people that, that did come in for exams. All these individuals were blinded and the, the physicians doing the examinations were blinded. So we had, 80% completion of one in-person screening exam. We had 86% uh, agreed to have the anal genital exam. And then once they did their first exam, they were given six month and 12 month follow-up. We had reasonably good uh, maintenance of follow-up visits. So of these six high-risk individuals, the one that declined showed up in our clinics four months later with an HPV-16 related nasopharynx cancer. The EBV was negative on that. It was early stage. Um, so there was one positive out of those high risk. One other of these patients had an anal uh, low grade dysplasia. It was HPV-16 positive and it's been positive in persistence at 12 months. We had one other patient who keeps having high risk HPV detected from their right tonsil. So they, they have their tonsil swabbed on follow-up visits. They have their base of tongue swabbed as well. And these persisted from the right tonsil at six, 12 and 18 months. So we suspect like this person probably has a tonsil cancer hidden there. It's just not become apparent yet. At the intermediate risk patients, um, we had two anal low grade anal dysplasias identified. They've been one of them's been persistent at 12 months. And of the five low risk uh, patients who were matched controls, no HPV lesions were detected. So um, upon leaving MD Anderson, I retired over there. I, I did um, receive a grant uh, from the Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas. Um, and we opened the, what's called the Trinity study. Um, Trinity River is one of the main rivers in Texas. It's basically the, the river with the largest, excuse me, the longest um, um, river in Texas with, it, with its watershed completely in the state. It basically connects the Dallas area and the Houston area. And we opened this study at UT Southwestern in Dallas and here at Baylor to recruit another thousand men so that we'd have over 1500 men in the study. We changed a couple things. We added to it the idea that rather than screening everyone who has oral HPV-16 identified, only screening those who have persistence. And we know that from cervical literature, it seems to be that those with persistent HPV detected at the cervix are really the ones at, at high risk for cervical cancer. So 
we've adopted this sort of idea with oropharynx cancer. So if, if you if you have HPV 16 on one time, that's not important. But if it stays there at 6, 12, and, and, and beyond, then those patients get selected to come in for screening. We've also, um, now this is talking about uh, nasopharynx cancer, and, and this is published in New England Journal about five years ago, showing how if you detect HPV, excuse me, EBV DNA in the blood, these people can be screened for nasopharynx cancer. And ultimately, they found 11% of those people would have a nasopharynx cancer identified. They showed they could identify nasopharynx cancer at a much earlier stage. You can see here 70% being stage one and two versus 70% being stage three and four, and their survival was better. And, you know, this is something I'm sure y'all have adapt, uh, adopted in your clinical practice, circulating HPV DNA to monitor your patients. This was great work from Bisham uh, Chera. Um, and we've uh, worked with, with the uh, Navaris company to start using this potentially for screening. Other people have tried this, have not seen a lot of uh, circulating DNA in a, in a general population like this, and no, um, no uh, association with oral HPV DNA or the antibodies to the E proteins. But some small work from um, Dan Fain, Dan uh, Fadden and, and uh, Laney Rettig um, in Boston, and they had serum samples on HPV-related oropharynx cancer and HPV-negative head and neck cancer patients stored that were before their cancer diagnosis. And they went back and looked at these old serum samples, and of the seven individuals with an HPV-related oropharynx cancer, three of them were, they could detect HPV DNA in their blood before diagnosis, and this is diagnosis date. So you can see here over a year before these people, you know, not quite four years, but three years before their diagnosis, they had circulating HPV DNA in their blood. So the Trinity study now is for men age 50 to 64. We screen for serology, we screen for circulating HPV DNA, and we screen on oral rinse for uh, HPV 16 DNA. If you're antibody positive or your circulating DNA is positive, if you're considered high risk, you're matched to a low risk individual, these folks are blinded. They don't know their results. They just know that they're selected for the longitudinal phase, which is actually in-person examination. Uh, we switched it to annually rather than every six months, ultrasound, anal exam and penile exam, and then you get follow-up every uh, year. If you're low risk, meaning your, your oral rinse, your circulating DNA, and your antibodies all negative, you just do an annual online health survey. And then intermediate risk, those with circulate, excuse me, with oral DNA positive, uh, they're matched to a low risk negative, and they get a mailed oral rinse sample every six months. And if they're persistent, then they come in for examination. Uh, we've so far got a total, including the Houston study and Trinity study combined, 894 men, 640 with results available for all three biomarkers thus far. Um, most people, of course, are negative. 7.5% um, are positive for one biomarker, um, four positive for two, and one positive for all three. This one patient is the one individual that had the nasopharynx, HPV-16-related nasopharynx cancer just looked at it a little differently. The prevalence rate, so prevalence rate of antibody is about just under 1%. The prevalence rate for circulating DNA is really 0.6% by what the company calls positive. But you may get this in some of your reports, occasionally patients will be indeterminate. That means they have a detected very, very low level. And in clinical practice, if you have a patient who has a very low level, you need to have a heightened worry because the company hadn't published this yet, I don't believe, but in, a, in about 30% of those people, they end up becoming true positive uh, as followed. So we, uh, we count those people as positive. Time will tell if that's uh, really um, appropriate, but um, that's what I've listed here as indeterminate. So, you know, if you include the indeterminates, the prevalence rate is quite high. And then oral rinse is about, uh, 
So this one patient did develop the nasopharynx cancer. The, of these three patients, one of them is that patient with the anal uh, l cell uh, who's persistent. So we've learned some lessons. One, it's hard to recruit healthy men in this age population. Uh, we had 80% compliance for those to come in to actually be examined. Maintaining follow-up requires a lot of vigilance and encouragement. It's, it's somewhat challenging. Uh, clinical problems remain. I think this group really recognizes number one here is it's very difficult to identify these primaries unless we could go in and take out everyone's tonsil and biopsy their base of tongue, which is an invasive procedure. It's hard to find a primary. Um, this is not like doing a cervical exam uh, or, for frankly, an anal exam. You, it's just hard to see an early lesion. Um, and then we, there's some work needs to be done on how we're going to follow these patients uh, annually, every six months. Uh, for those that are positive, should those that are negative get repeat tested every five years? We, we don't know the answer. We started to design um ideas for a large multi-institutional study we hope we've gotten recent nih funding uh to start exploring um at home testing um we're excited about this because it really might make it more practical to have a mailed uh test so in conclusion there's an hpv epidemic remaining in men and in women um their vaccination is imperative uh, we need to advocate more for vaccination. Uh, without novel screening, we're looking at at least 30 years of a problem. The anti-vaccine movement is clearly a danger, and I, again, encourage everyone to speak out against this when, when, when you have the opportunity. Um, viruses are, one thing we didn't talk about, viruses are responsible for about one in 12 cancers worldwide. And a lot of these, we have prevention options, for instance, HPV and Hep B vaccination. Hep C and HIV testing are major things that uh, we can do to try to prevent these cancers. So that's that's our study right there. Thanks for taking the time to listen. That's my team. We got some new faces, though, coming in. Um, and if you're ever in Houston, we'll take you to this Mexican restaurant. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Sturgis. Um, we'll take some questions. We have one uh, on the line as well. Dr. Paul Bryson asked, or do you want to ask in person, Paul? Oh, no, either way, you, you had a slide. Th thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sturgis, for, for joining us today. I, um, I just had a question. I'm always uh, impressed with these large sort of statewide or, or national studies and um, your, your slide kind of addressed it, but I, I wanted to know if you, you could comment further on sort of um, what do you think the keys to success for um, maintaining participation, driving recruitment, you know, any any sort of secret sauce to share to to getting, uh, you know, patients well, to enroll and, and stay enrolled? Yeah, I, I would say um, um, this has been a major problem of ours. Um, uh i particularly this population um where and i don't have a simple answer i i've been we've had some success with facebook advertising we've actually had some success with um a rather inexpensive mailed postcards oddly enough where you can identify households with um different demographics um we had did not have incentive program. We have free parking for the free valet parking for people, but we're about to institute some incentivization. Um, I think that's probably um, from my study coordinators. They think that would be a big help at MD Anderson it was a little easier because we had a big cancer, which you probably have at the clinic. We had a big cancer prevention um, network and that was a you know, a population that was already worried about cancer, and they were seen to be uh, more amenable to being approached for the study. Uh, we don't have that here. So um, um, I don't have a simple answer. I, I do think that COVID has shown us one thing, medical research uh, in person is, is difficult, uh, particularly for population-based stuff like this. And I think and that's what we're trying to do is develop at home testing. I think that'll make things a lot easier, making it as convenient as possible for people.
Rachel? Hi, thank you for a great talk. Um, I'm Rachel, I'm one of the uh, pediatric otolaryngologists. And I just had a question, you know, I um, for our kids who have really very aggressive respiratory papillomatosis, we've started to vaccinate them even though they're HPV positive and have shown that it helps with uh, treatment of their disease. And I was just curious if you guys are using vaccination as adjuvant in your treatment of these patients. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. I the 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 process is 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 different. P, of course, kids that have RRP have an active infection, and um, yeah, they should be vaccinated absolutely. Um, and I I've been trying to encourage our, our sinus surgeons as well. Um, you know, patients that have inverted papilloma and and other sinonasal active uh, papillomas should be vaccinated. Once someone has an invasive cancer. The likelihood is that they don't have um, active infection anymore. And we can't say that for sure, but a lot of the data suggests that the, the virus, if we can call it, live virus is no longer present. Um, there's viral DNA in the tumor, which is driving the tumor, but they're not actually contagious anymore at that point. Um, and of course, there's exceptions to that. Um, and the damage is, is already done. I certainly don't think there's any problem with vaccinating a patient uh, with a head and neck cancer, HPV related cancer, but it's not likely to have an impact on their on their disease. Now, there is a lot of work with therapeutic vaccinations targeting um, the HPV related oncoproteins E6, E7. And I think that has a therapeutic opportunity. It's a different process, of course, but um, um, there's some exciting stuff being presented um, this year. Uh, and actually there was some exciting stuff Bonnie Glisson did at MD Anderson um, showing that you can almost double the response rates to um, immunotherapy if you also vaccinate with one of these um, E6 related um, vaccine constructs. Interesting. Eric. Yeah, thank you, uh, Eric. Um, Eric Lamar here. Uh, great talk, and um, I, I look forward to seeing kind of what develops uh, with respect to screening. Um, one question I had is those patients that were determined to be high risk, how do you navigate that? So I, I imagine that evokes a lot of anxiety for these patients that they're at uh, a pretty substantial odds risk of, of developing cancer. And so um, I suspect yeah. that that motivates them to go uh, a little bit more um, uh, with respect to screening than the other cohort. And yeah. then uh, another question was um, these testing, uh, the serology, CT DNA are, are pretty expensive. Was that all covered by the um, by the grant itself or is is um, are, are are these companies picking up some of the, the tab as well? Yeah. OK, so the first one. Um, yeah, we in this study they are blinded. So they're told you may be selected for phase two, which means in-person screening. And those selected for phase two are either positive by the biomarker or they're a control, which is negative. Um, and in retrospect, I, I probably wish I had done it differently um, because I think you're absolutely right. If someone knows they're positive, even though it's an experimental, and we did that for, the idea that this is an experimental uh, work and we don't exactly know for sure the risk, um, though we have pretty good prospective data from those cohort studies. Um, and I think that would have actually, if we did tell people in our future work, we're going to uh, tell people, um, I think that would maintain compliance with follow up. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, weighing that anxiety issue, because you can be zero positive 10 or more years before you're diagnosed. It's a big issue. And this is an issue that uh, needs to be addressed um, in this disease. Of course, there's other issues happening right now in the cancer screening world around circulating DNA, right? And what does that mean if you can't find it? People are going to be anxious. People want these tests, but then they're going to be super anxious if you can't find where the cancer is. So um, more to follow on that. I don't have all the answers there. Um, the second question was um, the cost. So 
We are paying Navaris for the circulating DNA test uh, through the grant mechanism. Um, the cost on that um, is, it is high, uh, not to the grant, they gave us a discounted price, but I mean, if you're to go out and pay for that yourself, as you know, in your patient population, it's it could be high, but it shouldn't be high. To be honest, that stuff should be cheap. Um, and ultimately, I think it will be. The serology is going to be super cheap the way they're developing these. We're working now with a company who developed uh, during COVID one of the um, saliva screening for COVID. Those kind of tests are becoming super cheap nowadays. And we're trying to see the sensitivity of doing saliva testing for these antibodies because you will excrete these antibodies in your saliva. Um, so that's our current grant with Karen at Arizona State. We're excited about um, and we'll be screening. They actually have a huge sample of, of, of saliva samples and we'll be also doing it in patients too. So I think the cost of these sort of things are going to come down um, dramatically. Thank I have you. a question. So for patients who have a um, high risk screening uh, serology or you know dual test positivity, are there any and since the the rate of that positivity is relatively low even in this high risk general population, um, is there any thoughts on like doing at least prophylactic palatine tonsillectomy? Um, so um um. I was asked that um, when I first opened this study at MD Anderson by um, Dr. Patrick Hu, you may remember, who was the head of cancer medicine at the time. Um, the problem is people die from tonsillectomy, as you know, and um, it's not very good um, for a screening program to kill patients, so um, especially a rare cancer. So that that's crossed my mind. If 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 I was positive, I'd probably have somebody I trusted to do a tonsillectomy, frankly. Um, but um, I don't think it's something I can bring into the study. However, we are um, designing our next phase, and there's some early evidence from actually a um, a men who have sex with men cohort uh, from Australia that if you're sero positive. Um, they have a very small study of nine individuals that were seropositive, and they did PET scans. And they actually found one individual out of those nine that had an undiagnosed tonsil cancer. Um, so we're thinking about in the next iteration to incorporate after the exam and ultrasound is, and, and of course the other anal and penile exams are all negative, incorporating PET scan, which is of course expensive, but may lead us to um, advocate for a biopsy in a very selected um, individual. I mean, I completely agree with you, obviously for study purposes, you know, that's not a risk uh, worth undertaking, but I mean, if I had high screen, if I was a high risk patient, I mean, the, the prevalence of tonsillectomy is so common in the indication, I would also want to prophylactic tonsillectomy. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, it's been fun, and oh, uh, we have another one. Oh, we have another question. Okay. I have a I have a question. Hi, Dr. Sturgis. Uh, Jacob Miller, one of the radiation oncologists here. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, thinking, uh, you sort of alluded to it with PET scans. Thinking to the experience with screening and nasopharynx cancer. Any data or thoughts about using um, sort of non-contrast MRI or short sequence MRI in, in, to augment your screening patients who are biomarker positive? Um, thanks, Jacob. Yeah, I think nasopharynx cancer is a great um, way for us to learn some ideas like the circulating DNA. Antibodies have been talked about for a long time in nasopharynx cancer. There's a recent publication about that in in, in, in nasopharynx cancer screening. Um, in a disease which is much more uh, prevalent, much more um, higher incidence than oropharynx cancer in, in parts of this world. Um, I 
have no experience with the MRI other than working with people like Dave Fuller at MD Anderson and and some of the very, and Stephen Lai at MD Anderson. Um, and I think that that would be a, a great alternative. And um, love to talk to you more about it. Um, PET scan is going to be super. Anything that could be a little cheaper than PET scan would be welcome. Thank you. Yeah. We are doing, I will say, I didn't mention this in the talk. Um, uh, Carol at, at Hi Carol Thackery has done some work. They haven't published much recently on it, but with looking at transcervically at the base of tongue and the tonsil with the ultrasound. And when we do the ultrasounds in these individuals, we are trying to do that as well, but it takes some skill to learn how to do that. Ultrasound, of course, is super cheap. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. That was a wonderful talk and really uh, applaud you for doing such great work in screening. So thank you. Have a great day. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Eric.